It is the golden age of Greece, a unique window of time that gives birth to Western ideals of beauty, science, art, and a radical new form of government, democracy. To immortalize those ideals, the Greeks build what will become the very symbol of Western civilization, the Parthenon. It was the physical embodiment of their values, their beliefs, of their ideology. It remains for us a powerful statement of what human beings are capable of. But today, solving the secrets of how the ancients designed and engineered the Parthenon has taken on a new urgency. For after 2,500 years of being ravaged by man and nature, the building is in danger of collapse. Hidden behind its columns, a rescue mission is underway. The team must take apart, repair, and reassemble tens of thousands of its pieces. And although the Parthenon appears to be geometrically straight and made from interchangeable parts, subtle curves make each piece unique, varying by fractions of a millimeter. The quality of the engineering work and the precision is unmatched, even from us today. The restoration team has taken over 30 years and spent well over $100 million restoring what the ancient Athenians built in just eight or nine years. It is clear today's technology can only take the team so far. To rescue the Parthenon, these modern architects, stonemasons, and archaeologists must unlock the engineering secrets of the ancient Greeks. Up next on Nova, Secrets of the Parthenon. Peering over the rooftops of modern Athens, from its throne atop the ancient Acropolis, the sacred city in the sky, the Parthenon rules in shimmering splendor. Even in its present form, a stark marble ruin, the Parthenon is revered as an icon of Western civilization. Its shapely muscular columns, crowned with majestic capitals, are the very symbol of the classical world. Its height and width define perfect proportions. Its original sculptures have been looted and lusted after for their beauty. And if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, the Parthenon reigns as the most copied building in the world, from the French Parliament to the U.S. Supreme Court to banks, museums, and countless buildings that aspire to convey wealth, culture, and power. The Parthenon remains an enduring symbol. It was built to glorify Athens, but has taken on a much greater meaning. Despite the destructions of time and man, it still represents the highest level of human creativity. But as magnificent as the Parthenon is today, it is a shadow of its former self. 2,500 years ago, the Parthenon was built as the crowning achievement of classical Greece. It towered on the Acropolis at the center of a complex of temples and altars vividly painted and adorned with statues of mortal and immortal greats. The most prominent sculpture stood inside, 
A 40-foot-high gold and ivory statue of Athena Parthenos, the patron goddess of Athens. But that was then. Where Athena once stood, today stands a crane. Not a trace of her statue remains. Now her holy precinct is a construction site. For much of her temple lies in tens of thousands of pieces, some scattered around the Acropolis, some around the world, and some lost forever. What does remain standing is in danger of collapse. Now, a rescue mission, the Acropolis Restoration Project, is trying to save it. The team, guided by the meticulous investigations of Manolis Chorus, has set the bar high, salvaging whatever ancient marble blocks remain in order to create the most faithful restoration. The cost to date is easily over a hundred million dollars. We keep as much as possible of the original material and we do not damage the ascent material. The theory is that we preserve all the original pieces and we add only a few marble in order to fit them to the general construction. This capital, once atop a column, typifies the struggle they face. It is in six pieces, with many fragments still missing. First, Master marble masons need to puzzle together what pieces they can find, then meticulously recreate what is missing. The block itself weighs 10 tons. It will need to be hoisted to the top of a column consisting of 11 drums, of which many are also fragmented. Together, the drums and capital may have to support up to a hundred tons of surviving marble beams and sculpture. But before they can hoist the capital into place, the team must solve a more perplexing problem. On which of the Parthenon's 46 columns does the capital belong? For although the Parthenon may appear to be one giant building kit with interchangeable parts, it's not. The building celebrated as a symbol of beauty and perfect proportions hides an ancient secret. Kathy Poroski and Lena Lambrinu, architects on the restoration team, investigate. You think that all the blocks are square in this building, but in fact, if you check it with a set square, you can see that we don't have a, a right angle here. And when Porosky places her book on one end of the stylobate, the Parthenon's foundation, it can't be seen from the other end. This is because there is a curve in the middle of the lines and the stylobate, about six and three quarters centimeters high. Chorus and his team have investigated every angle on the Parthenon. And although the building looks straight, they've discovered there's barely a straight line on it. These curves are no accident. They start with the foundation, or stylobate. Each of the 46 columns has a gently curving profile and leans inward. Even the architraves, marble beams that span the columns, as well as the architectural elements above them, are curved. This means that each of the over 70,000 pieces of the Parthenon is unique and fits in only one place. And the difficulty of fitting the pieces back together is compounded by the Parthenon's history. Since it was built in the 5th century BCE, it has been shot at, exploded, set on fire, rocked by earthquakes, converted to a church, then a mosque, and in the 19th century, looted for its magnificent sculptures.
To make matters worse, at the beginning of the 20th century, the Parthenon was subjected to catastrophic restorations. More recent damage was done in the 1900s by the restoration team putting in these iron clamps. They rusted and expanded, cracking and destroying the marble. In addition, the early restorers put column drums and whole blocks back in the wrong place. Before the restoration team could even start, they had to correct these mistakes by taking apart, block by block, much of the Parthenon. Porosky took on the Herculean task of working out the original positions of 700 scattered blocks from the long inner walls of the temple. Although the block seems the same, each block is different. Each one has its own individual, unperceivable information, the cuttings, the heights. And the, we're talking about differences of a tenth of a millimeter here. That's about the thickness of a hair. The team turned to modern technology to assist them. Each stone, like everywhere on the Acropolis, was ID'd and entered into the computer system. As soon as a fragment of marble is found, it takes a number and it is uh, entered in the database. So far we have 5,500 architectural members of the Parthenon. All with detailed descriptions of height, width, slope, corrosion, cracking, stain marks, even graffiti. By mapping these variables, Porosky and the team hoped to reconstruct the two inner walls. We found about 52 criteria we could give maximum to one, uh, one block of the wall. If you measure all the, all the constructive elements, you have about 52 criteria. So we thought, let's try to put it on a computer program to press the bottom and to see if we have a result. But the puzzle proved too complex. Mathematically, it was working, but we didn't have any result. In the end, to put her wall back together, Porosky had to draw each stone onto a card and with the help of detailed measurements, shuffle them around. So the final decision was made by I. It took five years to identify the position of around 500 of the pieces. It's been over 30 years since the restoration began. The Parthenon is a 20,000 ton, 70,000 piece, three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. And worse, it's a puzzle that doesn't include instructions. No one has found anything resembling architectural plans. Where are they written, these things? Where are they writing? Do you have so many papers, you have computers, you have everything? How they are doing and how they communicate and we're going so quickly in eight years. I cannot understand, I cannot imagine. How did the ancient Athenians build the Parthenon with such precision in less than nine years? And why with these subtle curves and few right angles? How can the modern restorers faithfully repair and reassemble these pieces before air pollution and even earthquakes inflict further damage? To save this masterpiece of Western civilization for the future, Chorus and his team of architects, engineers, and marble masons will have to unlock the secrets of the past. The Parthenon was the greatest monument and the greatest sanctuary in the greatest city of classical Greece. It was the central repository of the Athenians' lofty conception of themselves and the physical marble embodiment of their values, their beliefs, their myths, their ideologies. It was as much a temple to Athens and the Athenians as it is to their patron goddess, Athena Parthenos. 
But just 30 years before it was built, Athens lay in ruins. A victim of Emperor Xerxes, leader of Greece's traditional enemy, Persia. The Athenians rallied the rest of the Greek city-states and with a series of heroic military victories, drive out the Persian invaders. With the foreign threat neutralized and nearly 200 cities across the Aegean paying into a mutual defense fund, Athens grows wealthy. It's now 450 BCE, and a former general emerges as leader, Pericles. He spearheads an ambitious campaign to rebuild Athens and ushers in the golden age of Greece, a unique window of time that establishes Western ideals of beauty, science, art, and a radical new form of government, demos, meaning people, and kratos, power, people power, or democracy. This is the area of Athens just beyond the Acropolis where male citizens came to vote. We think that during the fifth century, the assembly would have comprised about 30,000, perhaps up to 40,000 male citizens. Mid fifth century Athens was a golden age because of the constellation of powerful intellects who, who gathered there. Socrates studies philosophy here. Hippocrates considered the founder of modern medicine, according to later traditions, visited Athens. Herodotus, father of history, and Thucydides write detailed accounts of this time. Theater especially flourished. And this was a time of Sophocles and Euripides performing their wonderful plays to the public in these theaters, including this particular one, the Theater of Dionysus, on the south slope of the Acropolis. But while all of Athens flourishes, the Acropolis still lay in ruins from the Persian invasion. Then, in 449 BCE, Pericles proposes to rebuild the temples destroyed by the Persians. He opens the question to debate. Every monument, every element of the Periclean building program had to be voted upon so that these monuments would in fact be monuments of the democracy and not of one man, such as Pericles himself. In a powerful statement of their self-confidence, the people of Athens vote to rebuild the Acropolis. And at its center, a building to embody their ideals, the Parthenon. <laughs> 